Well, that was an incredible edition of Milan San Remo, and we have an incredible champion joining us. Simon, how's everything going? Yeah, good, thank you. So here in Australia at the moment, so bright and early in the morning uh, and a late finish of, of the race. But uh, yeah, it's good to be in Australia. I'm well, and uh, yeah, it was an awesome edition of Milan San Remo. Well, thanks for joining us, and let's get straight into it. Uh, what do you make of the finale in the race? Well, an unpredictable finale. I don't think anyone uh, really tipped uh, Jesper Sturven as a, as a big favourite to to win. Um, and then we had all the, the crowd favourites literally hot on his heels uh, across the line. So uh, an unpredictable final, uh, a great, exciting finish. I was sort of on the edge of my seat to the, to the last moment. You didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I was really disappointed for Caleb Ewan, again, for a second place. Um, the best of the rest because he was second when Nibali slipped away. Uh, a few years ago uh, for his win. Um, but uh, yeah, a great finish. And Amy, what did you make of uh, the, the race today? Yeah, it was um, kind of like characteristic of the race, no, like not a whole lot happened until the final kind of 20Ks or so. And then it was just like, yeah, nail biting finish. So yeah, it was really exciting. This is the thing, isn't it? But I think... For most viewers, they only watch maybe the last 40, 50K, and it's always um, exhilarating with the Cappy and the Cipressa and the Poggio uphill and that crazy downhill. But of course, it's the longest race of the year, more than 300K with a neutral zone, um, I think. And there's a hell of a lot that goes into it, kind of tactically, nutritionally, mentally, as well as physically. Um, Simon, you've done the race, I think, four times. Um, just talk me through what makes it so different and so special and difficult to win? Well, one thing they always say about Milan San Remo, it's probably the easiest classic to, uh, to finish, but the hardest to win because to win everything literally has to go right for you on the, on the day. You have to have the right legs, be in the right place and, and at the right time. And the reason it's, a, it's such a, such a difficult race um, to win as well is you literally have to be conservative for 200 and sort of, 70 kilometers of the race you really have to look after yourself as much as possible stay as light on the pedals have teammates around you literally keeping you up the front and sheltered um, to save as much energy as you can for the for the final because the final is the last 30 kilometers of milan san remo is probably some of the probably the most 30 kilometers exciting 30 kilometers of racing all season long i always say if you're going to watch uh 30 kilometers of a bike race watch the last 30 k's of milan san remo because it really kicks off uh, in a big way. This year, it just seemed a little bit more like a race of attrition. There weren't so many blistering attacks, but guys were just getting constantly shelled out the back. And I put down that that down to the really high speeds of this year's edition. And, and Amy, were you surprised by the pre-race favourite, Matthew van der Poel's failure to launch a meaningful acceleration on either the Depressor or the Poggio? like everyone's come to expect so much from him um after the way he started the season but he has just come straight from Tirreno so maybe it's not so much of a surprise that he might be a bit tired from that um yeah Simon what do you think of kind of of that but also the tactics of um uh, Van Aert and uh Alaphilippe today well, I think first on, on Vanderpool, uh, at a race like this where I was saying how your team is so important, obviously they, they control the front as well. They have one rider riding the front from quite early on in the race. But he had probably a lack of experience around him in, in, in the race. He wasn't that well placed um, on the on the Chipressa and then team Jumbo Visma kept the, kept the tempo really high so it would have been very difficult to attack there. And then we saw he actually got caught out of position leading onto the Poggio as well. And he started the Poggio, I don't know, maybe 20 or 25th position, whereas the big favourites, the rest of them, were sort of all huddled just about in the top 10. So he had to make quite a big effort to come past a number of guys while the pace was really high. And then I think when the attacks went and that last little ramp of the Poggio, um, he didn't have the legs really to bang over the top or, or make a really big difference in that in that part of the race. So... Um, like I said, he may have had some of the best legs, but a couple of little things just went against him in the race. And I think that probably affected his, his form uh, in the final. So that's Vanderpool. 
Van Art, again, really strong race, great team around him. They took on a lot of commitment for, for I think, so many people. He was the big favourite uh, to win this edition. Uh, we saw he tried across the top of the Poggio. He was right there when Alaphilippe uh, attacked. But, again, Alaphilippe really didn't have the legs to make the difference. So the three big favourites that I think everybody was talking about were there, but uh, not good enough to make any kind of difference. Um, I referred back to Caleb Ewan a little bit earlier. I was really impressed with how well he took on the Poggio. It actually looked like he might he might, was going to attack for a second across the top. And I think he followed um, uh, he followed Van Aert or somebody when they started to accelerate. Um, but he put in a fantastic ride. He was just caught out by a lack of teammates, I think. That's what struck me, that when you have Tim Wellens um, and Philippe Gilbert um, on your team, you could maybe hope to have one ally there uh, kind of on the Poggio and after the Poggio, but it, it didn't transpire and that might have made the difference, you know, between him winning and losing San Remo. Uh, I think all he needed was one teammate. You just saw how close it was in the final. They re they sprinted onto Sturman's wheel in the end. Uh, it looked like, I didn't see where Gilbert was, but I think it was Wellens who sort of peeled out of the line about halfway up the Poggio, so he didn't quite have the legs. But um, in the pieces of the races I saw, Caleb Yule was completely invisible. So he obviously had teammates around him, keeping him up the front and out of the wind. So maybe he burned a lot of his teammates earlier on in the race to make sure he was in the position he was in in the final. Let's go back to the day's breakaway. Like with San Remo, there's normally, it's a very long day in the saddle for several guys who clip off the front in Milan and spend, I think it was 250, 260K out there. Um, Amy, I went, can you imagine spending six hours in front like that? <laughs> no, no thanks. <laughs> you can keep that. <laughs> there should be a prize for I mean, that, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they had a tailwind. <laughs> they did, it's true, yeah. Um, but tactically as well, um, how did it change things for Stoyven having a teammate? Nicola Conchi up there. Well, I think it's it's only beneficial. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Amy. I think it's only beneficial no, no, you... to have a ha, have a rider in the breakaway uh, like that, um, particularly for the teams with the big favourites, because it takes the pressure off them to ride behind, and they're able to place you know one rider in the breakaway and then use the whole team to to conserve behind. Whereas if they are the, uh, a team of big favourites like um, Yumbo Visma with with uh, Van Art, for example, he had a rider riding in front basically the whole time. I think it was Paul Martin who did an enormous amount of work. So if you're a favourite, you can place a rider in the breakaway. It definitely takes the pressure off your teammates. If you're a team without a big favourite, I think it's just literally a, a sort of a publicity stint because you get six, six, hour, six odd hours of live television and your jersey and your sponsors up the front and on the TV. And can I be honest, I Simon? So, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, on. but is it, really, is it ever boring doing a 300k bike race <laughs> is it boring doing a 300k bike race uh there are some elements where it, the kilometers seem to go past really slowly but um you have to be concentrated the whole time you really can't afford to, to switch off too much um and like i said it's all those things it's eating drinking um staying up the front you know conserving your legs as much as possible staying really light on the pedals um, because every watt that you that you push at the start of the race is is, is less watts you have for the final. And let's unpick uh, the tactics of Ineos Grenadiers, um, who led over the top of the Chipressa and all the way on to Poggio. What do we make of that? Amy, go for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know really, because they didn't... I guess they must have been banking on... Pidcock being able to get away on the descent and get enough of a gap because he was really pinning that descent. I was terrified watching it. Um, so, and yeah, it was, we, I guess I was unsure, most people were unsure who they were riding for, whether it was Pidcock or Kwiatkowski, but Pidcock looked so comfortable, like sat in the wheels at the time, going over the climb. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. I guess that must have been what they were hoping for because they didn't really have anyone that was fast enough to finish with like the likes of Ewan. So I don't know. <laughs> so what do you think? Because you've ridden 
some time ago on a different version of that team, should we say, uh, Team Sky? Yeah, so when I was with Team Sky, it was very much very much tour focused. We didn't have a, a lot of firepower in, in the classics and in the one-day races. Um, but I was quite impressed with the way that Ineos uh, Grenadiers uh, attacked the final of the race. They were perfectly placed um, through the, the hard work of the likes of uh, Luke Rowe leading on to the Chipressa. Um, and then we saw Ghana lead it up to the Poggio, and they really they really rode the front and rode a, a high tempo. I think everybody was predicting a, an attacking final of this year's edition of the race. So to have protected riders in Pidcock and um, Kutowski uh, up the front uh, as their protected guys, they would have been looking after them to be able to follow those those final those final attacks, which didn't eventuate. We saw Pidcock have a little bit of a go on the descent of the Poggio. Um, but it was it was a little bit ill timed because if he actually had it gone at the same time as Sturvin, who knows what the outcome could have been. But they we also need to think that they were I think one of very few teams with with two riders in that front group, um, but yet not quick, not really quick guys, so they couldn't really capitalize on their on their hard work. Let's talk about the descent of the, of the Poggio. So Simon, what is going through a rider's head in that lead group? Well, it's pretty safe to say that all the riders in that league group are going to know the descent of the Poggio really well. They would have trained over it. Um, a lot of those guys will live in live in the area. Um, so they would have trained over it and they would have done their recons as well. Um, and there are only a few really tricky corners, but you have to make sure you get those right because all that hard work of nearly seven hours of racing can be very quickly undone by mistiming a corner on the Poggio. So you're just concentrating um, it's a slippery surface down there because the road is literally lined with, with olive trees. Um, so the olive tr trees will drop olives and, and literally oil on the road. So it's really, really slippery. Um, so that's, that's when it's wet, you see a lot of crashes. Um, looks like they had beautiful conditions today. So that wouldn't have been a huge concern. But yeah, you still have to stay very concentrated. And so when yesterday... Oh, thought... Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Go for it, Amy. I was going to say there was a guy who like narrowly missed going over the edge of the wall. I don't know who that was, but yeah. It's the same every year. There's always someone who <laughs> stacks it on maybe the same corner on the Chipressa. Um, luckily it was okay. Yeah. yeah. And they just put a kind of flimsy mattress over the side of the wall, which you think isn't the safest, the best way of catching a rider, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. He was nearly in the sea. It's sketchy, yeah. Fastest way to San Remo, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like that last 5K is possibly the most reliably exciting 5K of every cycling season. Um, it's kind of impossible to not watch it like on the edge of your seat. And we had Jasper Sturven making the winning move with 3K to go. Um, so Amy and Simon, just un unpick that move tactically for our, uh, for our viewers, if you can, please. <laughs> you got, you got yeah, you, you lead, Amy. Go for it. Um, I mean, I guess you just thought, like, I mean, there was a bigger group than normal, right? Going over the final climb. I guess what was going through his head must have been that he, it was now or never to attack. Um, and yeah, it worked out for him. So, yeah, that's my tactical insight for the day. <laughs> um, yeah, what I saw of the final there, um, we had a base of the front group of around 12 riders. And I think uh, all those 12 riders that were in the front uh, on the descent of the, of the Poggio, um, they were all one out. Nobody had a teammate there. So you could see that there was um, some attacks with, with the likes of, of Peacock trying to get away on, on the descent. Um, and they had to be shut down really quickly because as soon as anybody got a bit of a gap, that everyone was going to look at each other um, to try and to try and you know, who like to see who was going to close the gap. So in that group, Sturvin, he's by far from from the the quickest guy. So I think just before you you hit the the coast road off the descent of the Poggio, there's a little point there of the descent. It actually flattens out a little bit and it regrouped, and you can see that Sturvin actually come through the back of the group as they sat up a little bit in the front and then he used that momentum uh, to keep going. And it's a super fast running off the descent from the Poggio onto that coast road. 
they're going close to sort of 70 kilometers an hour. So you don't need much hesitation behind to get a gap really quickly. Um, so he jumped away and then I think it was Soren Crow Anderson um, who yeah. went after him and they were really lucky they got together because it looked like they swapped a couple of turns and Soren Crow Anderson actually led, led into the sprint for Sturban um, without that sort of um, the, the two guys working together there. They may have been caught a little bit earlier. So it literally all came together for, for Jesper Sturban, the fact that he jumped away at the right time, he got a good gap, then he got a little bit of help um, and was able just to hold off the sort of fast finishing, you know, Caleb Ewan and, and Van Aert to, to hold it off. So he, he took his chance. It was the one, it was the one card he had to play um, and he played it perfectly. And seeing that must make you think back to 2012. Um, so how does it feel to win San Remo? Uh, at the time, obviously, I was, I was super elated to win the race. It feels like a lifetime ago now. Um, it was, yeah, like you said, in 2012, uh, where I won the race. And again, it was a perfect storm for me. I jumped away with the right guys, um, with Nibali, with, with uh, Cancellara. Um, Cancellara wanted to drive it all the way to the finish. Nibali wanted to sit on because he, has, he had the, the pre-race favourite and Peter Sagan in his team at, at Liquor Gas at the time. And I was there, right place, right form, um, with the right opportunity. And, and really capitalised on that. All right, well, let's pick our um, unsung heroes as we do for every debrief from the race. So these are the guys who are maybe not the obvious picks, but who still shone or really made a difference to the end result. Um, Amy, do you want to go first? Oh, mine doesn't work if you say that made a difference to the end result. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, mine. you still go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and it's kind of silly. <laughs> I've got a silly one and a normal one. Go with both of them. My silly one is Taco Van der Horn because his name's Taco and he was on the Ataco. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all week. Um, yeah, he was in the break and he was like, they were about to get caught and he was like, I'm going to go. See ya for a bit. And uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty... His name's Taco. That's basically why. I chose him. That's a great pick. <laughs> making me feel quite hungry, actually, with dinner just around the corner. <laughs> exactly. And the normal one? Um, Sagan. Because he's, I mean, he was kind of an unknown, like he's just come back from having COVID. Um, and he was, he was up there and no one really saw him until he was, until he was there. <laughs> so, yeah. That's how you win San Remo or come fourth yep. five times like he, <laughs> yeah. like he has, unfortunately. Um, but his name's not Taco, so... I'm not interested. Second place. <laughs> Again, Peter, unfortunately. Uh, and Cybran, who's your uh, unsung hero? Uh, my unsung heroes uh, in Milan, so remember, the guys that you probably did, the guys we probably didn't see on TV so much. And they're the guys that have done all the hard work to protect their leaders. Uh, like, we, like we saw, there were um, 12 nearly individuals at the front in, in, in the final. So it goes to show that those guys have been really well looked after. When I look back, the guys like Paul Martins, who did, I think he rode the front for probably around 250 kilometres. Um, Tim de Klerk as well did a huge amount of work from, from what I saw. So for me, those guys, the unsung heroes, surely they were at the front on, on the camera, but um, they would have put in a huge amount of work for, the, for their team leaders. And then it's the ones, the riders who do um, the turns into the critical points of the races as well, uh, like Ghana leading it onto the to the Poggio, that is so hard to do to to time that effort correctly. Um, so for me, it's yeah, it's your Ghana's, it's your Tim de Klerk's, Paul Martin's, guys like that. Fair play. And now let's catch up on what you've been doing post cycling. So you retired after. Wait, Andy, moment. what? Who oh. are yours? Well, I thought we weren't. I thought I wouldn't do it because you pick such good people. But I, okay, I'll <laughs> pick one. Fine. You got me. But the name isn't very funny or like isn't Taco and he isn't as well known um, as Ghana either. Um, uh, it's going to be Nicola Conchi from uh, Trek Sigafredo, who by going in the break, he really allowed Stoyven and the rest of the team to hide. Uh, we didn't see Stoyven barely ever until he made that winning move. And that's how you win San Remo. Like, like I, I put something in my notes saying, let's have a look. The rider who hides the best closest to the front wins, which sounds, maybe that's a bit obvious, <laughs> but there's been a lot of winners that way, like over the years. Like, 
kind of like Matt Goss um, nine, 10 years ago. It was the same, wasn't it, Simon? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Gossi, when he, run, he won in 2011, uh, he was at the front, made all the right selections. I think it, it busted up quite a bit that day. Um, but he was not a rider that anybody was talking about leading into the race, yet he was on fantastic form. Um, rode, a, rode a great sort of tactically, rode the great, a great final. I remember him watching moves uh, following sort of Cancellara, making sure that he wasn't going to jump away. Um, uh, yeah, to win to win that edition. So yeah, it's a pretty it's a it's a pretty common element in Milan San Remo. If you've seen a rider a lot throughout the throughout the day, they generally don't have the legs to to finish it off in the in the final. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to win a beautiful race. Um, so tell us, what have you been up to since retiring from pro cycling? Uh, like I said earlier, my my cycling career feels like a lifetime ago already. So I finished up racing at the end of the 2018 season. Uh, I then moved across to to London, lived in London for a couple of years. I did I work with a, a bank for 12 months at, at Goldman Sachs. So I did a, an internship and then uh, worked within a bank just, uh, and that was a fantastic experience uh, to get out of the professional peloton into, into a sort of a corporate environment. Um, so I did that for, for a year. I got a lot out of it. And then an opportunity came up to work or to join the service course, which is um, a business that a, a former teammate of mine, Christian Meyer, founded. Uh, so an opportunity came up to, um, to work within the service course and join the executive team. So I've been working within the service course now for about 18 months. Um, and this is, it, it is something uh, I'm really enjoying the role. It's, uh, it's a business related role. Uh, to grow to help grow the business um, yet back in cycling so an industry that I'm really familiar with that I have a lot of friends obviously still involved in uh, so yeah that's what I've been doing doing it in the past couple of years. Now I'm looking forward to when this pandemic finally ends so I can head to maybe Girona or even Nice and have a nice flat white at the service course that'll be that'll be really great. Yeah, it'd be great to have you. So we have four four stores now. Uh, our most recent uh, recent one we opened in, in Nice last weekend. Um, and the idea of the service course, it's as the name alludes, it's a it's a holistic cycling business. So we have a, a travel offering. We have, like I said, four stores. Uh, we have the uh, the cafes alongside the bike shops as well. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great little business. Um, it's growing. We have some fantastic people involved. Um, and you kind of uniquely to our business, we have quite a lot of uh, riders who are, who are still racing the professional peloton who have invested in the business. Um, so they have supported this obviously with their, with their names, but also with their hard-earned money as well. Fantastic. Well, I'll join you for the coffee, but not for the training ride because you'll probably <laughs> blow my legs off. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Don't think so. Well, thanks very much, both of you for joining. Uh, me for Rulers Debris from Milan San Remo. Uh, if you like the video, then like and subscribe and join us very soon for another episode.